you know that when the lift is going up, it's going to be mg plus a. If it's coming down, it's mg minus a. You know that. Isn't it? In this case, it's, it's going up or down. The scale reads 400 Newton, which is actually less than what he would weigh, isn't it? His actual weight would be how much? 60 times 9.8. It would be like 588 Newtons. So since there's a smaller, it should be going down. So that's what it says. It should be going down 460 times 9.8 minus 8. So you calculate, you will get A as 9.8 minus 400 by 60, which is 3.13. It's close to 3.14. You know that it's downward. There's no banking. How do you know? Say so it's a flat curve, isn't it? Flat 200 meter curve, so there's no banking. And that means there's only friction that's letting it stay on the road. And you know that the centripetal force, mv squared by r, should be equal to mu mg. How do you get this mu mg now? What's the formula for friction? I mean the formula for friction. Mu times Fn. Yeah, on a level surface, Fn is equal to mg. So that's why you get mu mg. So rearrange that. Cancel the masses. Rearrange. Everything else is given. Coefficient of friction is 0 0.7 times radius 200 times 9.8. Remember to take the square root at the end, and your answer is 37 meter per second. You know that the potential energy of a spring is 1 half k delta x squared, isn't it? Potential energy. So when you stretch it to the point A, you're giving it potential energy, and then it's going back to the point B. So as it goes to the point B, at the point B, it will have both potential energy and kinetic energy because it's already moving, isn't it, when it comes to that point? Remember, it's, the spring is still uh, stretched. It also has kinetic. That's why you have potential energy at A is equal to sum of potential plus kinetic at B. That's the concept. That's all. After that, it's math. Cancel the halves, rearrange. What are we looking for? Speed? So we're looking for VB, isn't it? Make VB the subject, that's it. So VB squared is KXA squared minus XB squared divided by the mass. Plug the numbers in. K is given as. Take a look at K. It's one newton per centimeter. You cannot use that. It should be a thousand newton per meter, isn't it? I mean, hundred newton per meter. So, and then X A, X B, all both changed into meters, and you get it as 0.173 meter per second. Powers work over time. That's mgh by time. Plug in the numbers, that's right, you get 70, I mean 736 watts. That's why I do this. Yeah, potential, uh, there I wrote potential energy is a function of distance, which is essentially the same, so take, huh. I decided to give it another way. You know potential energy is 1 half kx squared for a spring, isn't it, generally? And if you take du by dx, what do you get? Check this. There's another chance for you. du by dx, you know x squared is 2x, and so it gets cancelled, and you get kx. See? I proved it. But you also know that f is equal to negative kx, don't you? You remember? f is negative kx, so that's the relation. 
and du by dx between negative 5 and negative 2, like we said, it's negative 6 by 3, which is negative 2. But f is negative du by dx, so f is positive 2. Do the same for the next. Second part, du by dx is 0. And in the third part, between 1 and 4, 5, yeah, between 1 and 5, yes. It's negative 4 by 4. Negative 1, when you take the negative that, you get positive 1. So what's the answer? A, B, C, D, E, D. To number 7. First at A, it has both kinetic and potential. So plug in the numbers. Last is 20, so square root, you get 400. And then the potential energy. Add those numbers up. 1.73. Times 10 to the 5 joules. Okay. B. At point B, it only has kinetic energy. <coughs> you know that energy is conserved. So whatever total energy it had at A, the same must be the energy at B. Isn't it? That's why. We say 1.73 times 10 to the 5. Huh, what's the total energy? Okay, you had nothing to do. So, third part, that is C, that's where you set it equal to one, one and a half mass times velocity squared. And rearrange to get the velocity as 65.8 meter per second. So do the same thing at C, except that it has potential energy also. But the total should still be 1.73 times 10 to the 5. You have to find the speed, so make velocity the subject, rearrange. Right by the mass, and you get velocity is equal to 34.4 meter per second. When you compress the spring, it has potential energy, isn't it? When you release it, all that potential energy changes into kinetic energy. That's all. Set them equal to each other. Plug in the numbers and calculate what you're supposed to calculate. In this case, it's a spring constant. So... And do remember to convert the velocity and the displacement into meter per second and meter. Get 1.39 Newton per meter. Power, you have, because power is given, power is work over time, and work can be written as force times displacement by time. Displacement divided by time is velocity. And therefore, you have power as force multiplied by velocity. Just plug in the numbers and find the force. 500 divided by 8. That is actually 62.5, but 63 newtons. Okay, number 10. Change in kinetic energy is equal to work done. And work done is force multiplied by displacement. So 100 times 6 gives you 600 joules. That is the change in kinetic energy. 
Okay, question 11. The work done in lifting the bucket is equal to change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy because you see that when it reaches the top, it's also moving at 4 meter per second. So, mg times change in height plus one half mass times change in velocity squared. So that's 20 times 9.8 times 30, that's the change in height, plus one half times 20 times square root of 4, which is 16. So add those two numbers up to give you the answer as 6040 which is, of course, 6.04 kilojoules. <coughs> Question number 12. The airplane is flying 30 degrees north of east, and the wind is blowing in a direction 10 degrees south of west. So the angle of the wind blowing is about 20 degrees, not about, actually 20 degrees off, the direction the airplane is flying, isn't it? Can you look at that and make that out? 30 and 10. So what I did is, I took the component of that. See, I, oh, I took the component here, which is going to be 2400 cos 20, isn't it? Because that's the adjacent side. So I got 2255 Newton. Isn't that exactly opposite to the direction in which the aircraft is flying? Are you seeing this? This component, isn't it exactly opposite to the direction in which the aircraft is flying? Come on, isn't this how the aircraft is going? Okay, so that's exactly opposite to that. So the aircraft has to do work against that wind. And so you assume that it applies the same force So you multiply with the force that you got, 2255 times the displacement, <coughs> which is 120 kilometers changed into meter. And you get that as 2.7 times 10 to the 8. But remembering that this is work done against you know that it's negative that much because the airplane is doing work against, like doing work against friction, isn't it? So, number 13, you got to find the work done. That will be the area. And there is 0 0.5 plus 1 times 5. Now, how did I get that 0 0.5? If you look at that graph, you can see that there's a small little triangle in that graph, if you look at 2, isn't it? That's where I get the 0 0.5. And then you have the rectangle. So that'll be 1 times 5. Add them up. That's the work, 5.5 joules. That should be equal to change in kinetic energy. So the initial velocity is 2.5. You're looking for the final velocity. Well, it would be 1 times 5 because it starts from 3 to 8. Between 2 and 3, you have a little triangle. Do you notice that? Okay, you get it as 3.3 .3 meter per second. Okay, 14. That's the Earth and the satellite. See, I'm trying. 
And that's how you get your formula. Centripetal force is provided by gravitational force. Cancel the masses. One of the radius, and that's it. That's how you get the formula for orbital velocity. See, square root gm divided by r. Okay? And if it's revolving close to the surface of the Earth, it will become square root gm divided by radius of the Earth. Did this question say that it's just about the Earth's surface? Take a look. Yes. That is why the small r became capital R. Plug in the numbers and you get... You remember what you should get? I told you. 7,900 meter per second. 7.9 kilometer per second. That is your orbital velocity of a satellite that revolves close to the surface of the Earth. Then you find the time period using 2 pi r by v, because that's the circumference divided by the velocity. Plug the numbers for radius and velocity and get 5066 seconds. What kind of question? You have to find the time period, but in this case, it's 100 kilometers above the planet's surface. So you have to find the radius, add the height in meters to the radius. That's what I did. 3.4 times 10 to the 6 plus this. That would be 3.5 times 10 to the 6. And then use the same formula as before. Six point four two times ten to the twenty three divided by the radius. Isn't the gravitational force is the same for any planet? The universal gravitational constant? Yes. Yeah, that's why it's called the universal gravitational constant, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's the same, yeah. And you have to remember that number, six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven. So you get the velocity as that, and time period is two pi r by the Here's number 16. It's about the International Space Station. We're trying to find its period. Just the same as before. First find its radius by adding the height. Remember to change the kilometer into meter. Add it. That's the radius. I should have written meter here, okay. Plug in the mass and the radius. And get the velocity as 76, 86 meter per second. Do you also notice that the further you go away, the smaller the velocity of the satellite? If it was close to the surface, it was 7,900 meter per second, isn't it? But now it is 76, 86. The, the higher you go, the smaller the velocity. Then find the time period again. Using that, two pi times the radius by velocity. That's 
that. It's 55, 14 seconds. So you use Kepler's third law to use uh, to do number 17. The square of the time period is in proportion to the cube of the semi-major axis. So TA squared by TB squared is equal to RA cube by RB cube. Because the moons are called moon A and moon B. So you got to find the time period for moon B, so make that the subject. Time period for A is 20 days. You know that taking cube root is raising it to 1 over 3, isn't it? Cube root, so. So the, the answer for that, after you plug in all the numbers, is 160 days. You are asked to calculate the acceleration of the ball. Any object moving in a circle has centripetal acceleration given by V squared by R, isn't it? That's the formula for centripetal acceleration. What's the velocity here? 5. Radiuses in centimeters change it into meter, 0.5. So the answer is 50 meter per second squared. Number 19. Uh, it's a flat curve, no banking, so the only force that keeps it on the road is friction. So mv squared by r is going to be mu mg. Or oh, we talked about it this night, didn't we? So square root 0 0.6 times the radius, 300 meter times 9.8. You get the answer. As 42 meter per second. Number 20. That's the hilltop. That's the car. The force is acting, the weight acting vertically down and the normal reaction. If the normal reaction is zero, that's when the car will jump, isn't it? Which means the centripetal force balances the weight exactly, so velocity square root of r times g will be 120 times 9.8. Take the square root of that. Get 34.3 meter per second. So the centripetal force that you actually require is this much. And we squared by R. Put that and you get that as 3001 Newton banking provides Fn sine theta. Look at the diagram one more time. Weight acting vertically down, normal reaction inclined, that angle is theta. And you break Fn into two components. Know that, uh, well, Fn cos theta balances mg. So from there, you can find Fn. See, what I'm trying to say is look at the normal reaction and look at Mg. Are they equal and opposite? Right? And that is Fn cos theta, isn't it? Not, not Fn. Oh. Remember, this is Fn. So this component is Fn cos theta. So Fn cos theta is equal to mg. From there you get Fn. As 6257 Newton. Because you're going to need it. And then the centripetal force is provided by Fn sin theta. We already know the normal force. Which we found out. Now all you need to do is put sine 20. Multiply with that, and you get 2140 newtons. Okay. 
So totally you required a centripetal force of how much? 3,001 Newton. Are you watching this? You needed 3,001 Newton there. And you only have 2140 provided by the banking. So the rest must come from friction. That is the idea. So you take the difference between the two. Friction force should be the difference. Which is 861 Newton. And you know that coefficient of friction is friction force divided by Fn, which is 861 divided by 6257, which is equal to 0 0.13. I tried to draw a diagram. Okay. Now, take one object at a time, draw the free body diagram, the force is acting on object one. There are three forces acting on object one, isn't it? It's weight, down, normal reaction, and the tension in the string. Of course, friction also in this case. So there are four forces acting on object one. Remember, object one is this one. So there's tension in the string. There's friction opposite weight and normal reaction. When you come to object two, there are only two forces. It's weight acting down and tension. So now you can make two equations for object one. The net force, Ft minus Ff, because you know that the vertical will cancel each other is equal to mass times acceleration, m1 times a. For the second one, because m2g, remember this is bigger than that because it's going down, so m2g minus ft is m2a. We have done this before. You got your two equations, add them up. If you add them up, the plus ft and the negative ft will get cancelled. And that's what you have, m2g minus friction is that and so rearrange to get the acceleration of the system. That's the formula that you get for the acceleration of the system. And if you put in the numbers, you will be able to calculate the acceleration. Plug all those numbers in. You okay. get. 6.05 meter per second squared as the acceleration. Then take the value of acceleration and plug it into one of those equations. I think I used number two. Rearrange, make Ft the subject, and then substitute. You will get the tension. So the tension is 56.25 newtons. 23, inclined plane, 30 degrees. The forces are the weight acting down, resolved into two components, mg sine theta and mg cos theta. And you're asked to find the acceleration here. It's frictionless. So the acceleration is just force by mass. It's mg sine theta divided by the mass, which is g sine theta. There's no friction, so it's g sine theta, which is 0.5 times g. Come on, if there is friction, then this is the modification that happens. How much do you get in terms of g? Just get it in terms of g. What do you get? Uh, there will be m and g. How much do you get? Well, I think 0 0.0867 mg, isn't it? 
Yeah. So you subtract that and find the acceleration. So this time your acceleration is going to be the force that you had before, mg sine theta minus 0 0.0867 mg divided by the mass. See how it works? And the, you know that the mass will get cancelled throughout. And just plug in the number here. Of course, here you have 0.5, don't you? 0.5, so acceleration will be 0.5 g minus 0.0867 g divided by, uh, that's it, mass got cancelled. How much is that? <coughs> How much? 0.4? times g, isn't it? That'll be the acceleration in that case. Or two objects push on each other, 30 kilogram, and the other one is 7 kilogram. And says the first one is accelerating at 2 meter per second squared, and you have to find the acceleration of the second. I call them object 1 and 2. F12 is force on 1 due to 2, isn't it? Force on 1 due to 2 is mass of that times its acceleration. So that's 60 Newton. So if 1, if 2 is applying a force of 60 Newton on 1, according to Newton's third law, the other one must apply an equal and opposite force, right? So it should be negative 60 Newton. So negative 60 is equal to mass of the other one, 7 times A, so A is negative 60 by 7, it's negative, that, that negative shows that it's going in the opposite direction. So if the first one was going to the east, then this is going to the west. I just had to draw it, call them 1, 2, 3. That's the first vector. Second one. Yes. The third one. Isn't it? And then add them all up, and the net force must be zero. So that the acceleration is zero. Add all the i's together and add the j's separately. So you get negative i plus 5 j's. Therefore, the fourth vector should be the opposite of that. So where you have negative i, you'll put positive i. Where you have 5 j, you'll put negative 5 j. Because when you add them up, you'll get zero. So that's your answer. <coughs> 